Number 14, one God today. We began this class looking at the Bible. We looked at the Old Testament and then the New Testament, and then we looked at church history. In the Old Testament, we began by looking at Genesis, and we saw that in Genesis, there was no struggle. And why that's so interesting is because the other creation stories from that part of the world at that time had gods fighting with each other, killing each other, and out of the dead corpses creating the heavens and the earth. And then in Genesis 1.1 we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I think the impression that anyone reading that in their time would have said, who is this God? Who is this God so supreme that he doesn't even fight with the other gods? He just speaks and there's light. He speaks and he separates the water. He speaks and the dry land appears. Like, wow. So I think right from the very first sentence of the Bible, the Bible is teaching us one God overall. And then we looked at the Ten Commandments and how God brought his people out of Egypt and how the very first commandment was, I am Yahweh your God, you shall have no other gods before me. And then he brought them out of Egypt, and there was the whole uh, 40 years in the wilderness, and then he gave his people the Shema. And he said, listen up, Israel. Hear, Israel. Shema, Israel. Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Moses taught them that there's one Yahweh, and that Yahweh is their God. And then we looked at the prophets, and we saw how the prophets passionately preached against idol worship and the gods of the nations. And how Yahweh is one, and Yahweh is over all, and Yahweh is the only God for us. Then we got to the New Testament, and we asked the question, well, what did Jesus believe about God? And we saw that Jesus actually quoted the Shema when he was asked, what's the first and great commandment? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love him with everything. And the scribe, who uh, is a Jewish scribe, said, you're right. Then they agree together on who is God. Jesus agrees with the Jews that the one God is Yahweh. And then we ask the question, well, if Jesus isn't God, then who is Jesus? If, he's, if Jesus is not the one God overall, then how, well, what do I say about Jesus? And we, and we saw throughout the Gospels in particular, the clearest, repeated identity for Christ is Messiah. That's, you have Yahweh, the Father, God, one God overall. That's, that's where he's at. What is the role of Jesus? Jesus is Messiah. He's anointed to rule as God's agent. And then we ask the question, what about the rest of the New Testament? What does it teach? And we saw that over and over and over again, whether we're looking at Jesus or uh, in his ministry on earth, or whether we're looking at his heavenly ministry, or even if, if we're looking at what he's going to do in the final days when the kingdom comes, that over and over and over he says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. The Father is the one who sent me. He's greater than all. My Father is greater than I. Uh, or he lives because of God. Or he lives to God. Or God is the head of Christ. Or in the end, he will be in subjection. He will hand everything over to the Father, to God, so that God may be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Um, So then we looked at some of these scriptures that people point at to say, well, don't these say Jesus is God? And we saw a lot of them are really on shaky ground. Um, But that there are one or two that are pretty strong. And we asked the question, well, all right, so what if the New Testament does call Jesus God? What does that mean? And then we explored how, well, it means that he's his agent or representative because God calls other humans God, like Moses, like the judges, like uh, the divine council or angels. They're not humans, but he calls them gods as well. And so the idea is that if you're representing God, if you're his ambassador, if you're his agent, you can use, you can have this term applied to you. And then finally, we looked at the crucifixion, the resurrection, the exaltation, and his heavenly ministry before the, um, considering the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ is how they're able to be present today. But the Spirit is not itself its own person. 
you know, it, it doesn't have his own name, it doesn't have his own identity apart from the Father and the Son. Not that it's an it either. I mean, it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the presence of a person, right? So uh, use whatever pronouns you want. We're, we're in a time where everyone wants to use their own pronouns. So, you know, good luck figuring out what, which one is to use for the Holy Spirit. Um, and then we delve into church history. We looked at the 2nd and 3rd century. We looked at the 4th century. Boy, what a, uh, what a crazy world, huh? Could you even make that stuff up? Um, so uh, I thought what I would do just at the top here of this uh, One God Today teaching is run it through. Not just from the 2nd and 3rd century, but all the way up to today. And uh, just very briefly, I'm not going to share lots of quotes and stuff uh, or pictures, but uh, uh, just very briefly describe one God believers. Now we know when it comes to before Christ history that we have the Old Testament. Where does the Old Testament begin? In the beginning. So whenever that was, okay, whatever year you want to date that to, from the very beginning, the Old Testament begins there, as far as describing who God is and how God works with his people. In the Old Testament and then the New Testament brings us all the way up to the first century after Christ, the year of our Lord. But then in the second and third centuries, <coughs> we saw the dynamic Monarchians and the Logos Incarnationists. Complicated names, but what do they have in common? They both believe there's one God overall, and that Jesus is his subordinate son. The difference between the two is the dynamic monarchians don't believe in pre-existence, and the Logos theorists do believe in pre-existence. Then we looked at the 4th century controversies between the subordinationists and the Anath Athanasian egalitarians. And we saw that, sadly, the Athanasian egalitarians won the Roman Empire and convinced the emperor to endorse their doctrine. But also, in the 4th century, you had Photinus and the Photinians who were flourishing in the Roman Empire. And then shortly after that, in the 5th to the 7th century, you had this gentleman by the name of Bonosis and the Bonosians. And then in the 4th to the 7th century, the Arians survived. Okay, So I, I want to clarify just a historical point. What I'm calling these Logos Incarnationists, Okay, that's what they're called, or that's what I'm calling them. They don't even have, they don't even have, usually people just call them Orthodox. I don't think they necessarily had the right, right opinion. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't want to like label them by that term. I want to label them by what they believed, not by if I think they're right. Okay, so uh, these Logos people, let's we'll just call them Logos people. After Arius comes along, they're called Arians. But it's the same belief. Christ preexisted as the Son who was begotten before which he didn't exist. It's all the same belief, all right? Uh, but that just kind of maybe can help clarify some things. If you hear the term Arian, it's the same as these Logos incarnationist types. So in the 4th to the 7th century, the Arians survived outside the Roman Empire among the barbarians, the Visigoths, the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, and the Lombards. And then in the 7th to the 9th century, the Polycians were in Armenia and then in the 9th to the, third, 9th to the 11th century, the Tondrakians were an offshoot of the Polycians. And uh, I found some good stuff on them from F.C. Connie Bear, who um, found this document called The Key of Truth and talks about the Tondrakians as Polycians who believed like Theodotus of Rome. I don't, know if, I don't know if you remember Theodotus, but Theodotus was a dynamic monarchian from the 2nd century. Um, then in the 10th century, we have some a little different groups, more Gnostic, more dualistic type groups, but still subordinationists. And uh, those are the Bogomils and then also the Cathars. And the Cathars are around from the 12th to the 14th century, so they go for quite some time. Also in the 11th century, the Nazarenes get mentioned by Cardinal Humbert. And then in the 12th and 13th centuries, the Pasigians get uh, we, we hear about them as keeping the law and believing in Logos Christology. So both of these groups here, <coughs> both of these groups here, the Nazarenes and the Pesagians, I'm not sure exactly how to say that, um, both of those groups there are Christians who are keeping the law 
who don't believe in the Trinity. One of them doesn't believe in pre-existence, the other one does. Okay? So uh, Jewish Christian groups are what we would call today Messianic Jews. So they're there in the Middle Ages. In the uh, 15th century, there are a number of hints. It's hard to get good information, especially in the 14th and the 15th century. But uh, there, there, there are, uh, there's this huge movement happening called the Renaissance. And uh, Marsilio uh, Ficino and um, Lorenzo Valla and there, there's some others that are pushing against the Trinity. And they're, tr they're translating John 1 in different ways. Instead of using the word verbum or verbum, uh, they use the word um, vox. So instead of translating John 1 in the beginning was the word, they translated in the beginning was the voice. See how that would really change what you think you're talking about, not a separate individual, but God's voice. Uh, so this, there's kind of like little hints about in the 14th century and 15th century, but then in the 16th century, something amazing happens. Something amazing happens. You know what happens in the 16th century? Martin Luther. Hello. Martin Luther in the 16th century really pushes hard to get the Bible in the language of the people. He translates the Bible into German. The Bible gets translated into French. The Bible gets translated into English. The Bible gets translated into other languages of the, you know, the European world at that time. <coughs> and guess what? As soon as people start reading the Bible, we find lots of subordinationists. We find lots of people that recognize there's one God overall. Now, were they there before that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I can't, I can't say for sure. History is really difficult when you're not dealing with the people that are in power. Um, but I can tell you this, that as soon as that Bible was in the language of the people, we hear about Claude of Savoy, Michael Servetus, Adam Pastor, Fausto Sozzini, all in the 16th century, founders of groups. Well, not all founders groups, but some of them were. In the 17th century, then we have the Sicinian communities in Transylvania and Poland, and also John Biddle in England. So the uh, Sicinian communities are whole significant communities of Christians, not just like isolated individuals, but like whole churches, um, at least until 1648, when the Polish brethren get exiled and settle throughout Europe. Now, another clarifier here. After... This, after the 1600s, if there are any dynamic monarchians, we call them Sicinians. So just like the Logos guys got renamed Arians, the dynamic monarchians got renamed Sicinian after this guy here, Fausto Socini. The Latin version of his name is Socinus. The Italian version is Socini. Sounds a little more Italian, right? But uh, his, his Latin name was Socinus, and that gets uh, the people that agree with him get called Socinians, all right? So um, that kind of clarifies that maybe a little bit for you. Then, uh, so in 1648, the Socinians in Poland all get kicked out. King Casimir says, get out of here. We don't want your kind in my country. So that means they spread everywhere, which is really good. It's sad, it's tragic, because everybody loses their homes, they're all poor, but like, it's really good because then it forces these people not to just be comfortable, but now to move other places and spread this understanding. In England, from 1687 to 1702, there was what they call the Sicinian Controversy in the Anglican Church, where Church of England priests and bishops and, and different clergy were arguing with each other, writing pamphlets and books against each other, and many of them are saying the Trinity is wrong, and we should not be Trinitarian anymore as a church. And others saying, no, the Trinity's right, you're crazy, you're a heretic. That's what we've always believed. And, we and since this happened in the 17th century, like we have a lot of the books survive to today. Then in the 18th century, also in England, Isaac Newton, strong one God believer. William Whiston, the guy who translated Josephus, that most of us who own the book of Josephus to this day is his translation. Samuel Clark, Theophilus Lindsay, all uh, are in England in that period, in the uh, 18th century. And Theophilus Lindsay uh, starts the first 
Unitarian Church in London, the first uh, you know, church that is, is allowed to be formed in, in England. Now, a word about Unitarian. So I, I told you you have these Arians and you have the Sassanians. They both believe there's one God overall. Arians believe in pre-existence. Sassanians don't. Both together, we call them Unitarians. Either one. Unitarian just believes, it just means you believe the Father is the only true God. So this is, again, this is not a word we find in early church history. This is a, a word we find later on, especially like in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, we have the U word. Um, but Unitarian can embrace a number of different beliefs. 18th century Unitarian comes to America. Coming to America. So we had Joseph Priestley. Then we had some presidents, biblical Unitarian presidents, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, all uh, flourishing in the 18th and early 19th century. Then in the 19th century, a lot of the Unitarian churches in America, and there were many, Thomas Jefferson thought the Unitarian Christians were going to be the majority very soon in his lifetime. But what happened is instead, these congregations embraced transcendentalism and universalism and ended up rejecting biblical authority. And they become known to us as the Unitarian Universalists. Okay? So that's, you, you, you have now, starting in the 19th century in America, two kinds of Unitarians. Unitarians that believe in the Bible and the authority, recognize the authority of Scripture. And we call them biblical Unitarians. At least that's what I call them today. Biblical Unitarians because they believe in the Bible as an authority. And then Unitarian Universalists. These are ones that don't accept the Bible as authoritative. They might agree with the Bible on some things, but they don't, they're not sitting under Scripture. They're looking at it and deciding what parts are legitimate. And that's why so many people don't like the U word. <laughs> Because if you say Unitarian, people assume Unitarian Universalists. So a lot of us uh, who maybe would feel awkward calling ourselves dynamic monarchians or uh, Arians, you know, certainly after the Holocaust, you don't want to call yourself an Arian, right? Because uh, people are going to hear that as, you know, a certain super race of Germans or whatever. Um, so... Like, all these terms get trashed. You know, if you say you're a Sassanian, somebody might say, bless you. Uh, so what do you call yourself? So I, I, I usually use the term biblical Unitarian just to clarify that I believe in the Bible as an authority and that it's inspired, right? But I also believe it teaches there's only one God, the Father. So that's, that's kind of how I, how I work with it. Other people call, call it Unitarian Christians, which I think is fine. You can call yourself a monotheist. Just don't call me late for dinner. All right, number, um, the next one there. 19th century, that's, that's the 1800s, 19th century American Restorationists. Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, and John Thomas, as well as at Venice, Joseph Marsh, and Benjamin Wilson flourished. Between that list of names there in America in the 1800s that I just read to you, I count no less than three denominations that still exist to this day who were founded by those different men. In the 20th century, there was huge growth um, of 19th century biblical Unitarian groups and the start of several more in North America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In the 21st century, the Unitarian Christian Alliance was founded which now has members from over 40 countries. And the affirmation of the UCA, the Unitarian Christian Alliance, is the one God is the Father alone. And Jesus is his human Messiah, who is now exalted as Lord and Savior. So if you agree with that affirmation, then um, you fit in with the Unitarian Christian Alliance as an organization, which is now publishing books, and we have an annual conference. Um, so all this is to say that I believe today we live in an exciting time. I'm so excited. I'm so thankful to live now. I think it's great. No longer 
can they execute us for this belief? Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you so thankful? And you know what? I think that's just about what it would take to kill this thing or to slow it down. Because uh, I believe this is a truth whose time has come. I believe this is a truth whose time has come. No longer can they execute us. No longer can they exclude us from the city. No longer can they uh, add extra words into our Bibles like they did with 1 John 5, 7, where they crafted a Trinitarian phrase and squeezed it into Scripture. Thankfully, that's all been removed in our modern translations. No longer can they limit us to our own, to their translations, right? We have our own translations. Uh, no longer can they prevent us from studying the history of what happened in all its ugly detail. No longer can they stop us from publishing books. We may be few, but we are mighty, motivated, and we're making a difference. I believe that the world is ripe for change. You know, it says in Leviticus 26.8, I don't know if you have this on your refrigerator, but maybe you should put it there. Leviticus 26.8, it says, Five of you shall chase a hundred. If you're with God, you can win. Five of you shall give chase to a hundred, and a hundred of you shall give chase to ten thousand. Look, I think we can win this thing. We have blogs, YouTube channels, podcasts. We're getting the word out. We have websites, books, scholarly articles, and now we have this class, which hopefully will do some good in the world. Now, somebody might ask the question, but how can this understanding of God and Christ be right, considering so many who believe in the Trinity idea? That's a good question. That's, that's a, honestly, hey, let me tell you, that is a good question. Let me tell you another way of asking the same question. How can God, how, excuse me, Mr. Unitarian, Mr. Biblical Unitarian, how can, how, why would God let the church get so off track for so long? That's a good question, right? Well, first of all, first thing I want to say is popularity is no guarantee for truth. Just because a lot of people believe something doesn't make it truer or falser, if that's even a word. Uh, believing something doesn't make it true. Not believing something doesn't make it true. If you want to base your life on popularity, stop being a Christian. In our world today, there are more non-Christians than Christians. About one-third of the world is Christian. That means two-thirds not. So if popularity is what gives us truth, then we should all stop being Christians. How could God let two-thirds of the world not be Christian? I don't know. How am I supposed to tell God what he's doing? Right? I'm just supposed to be faithful with the light that he gives me. And look, no one thought some insignificant Catholic monk 500 years ago when he's over at the church door at Wittenberg and he's tapping his 95 theses to argue in Latin with some other nerdy scholar about his interpretation of indulgences. Nobody's thinking, oh, that guy, he's going to change the world. You know what the options were when you were growing up in Europe in the 1500s? Catholic or Catholic? So what if somebody told Martin Luther, oh, well, you know, uh, I, don't think, I don't think you really have a point because, you know, uh, everyone else disagrees with you. Well, he did have a point. He did have a point. The church had gotten off track and needed to get back to the Bible. That's what he said. And that's what we're saying. We're just continuing that legacy. We're not challenging that legacy. We're, we're taking it to the next step. What about this other doctrine, Martin Luther? You never got, gave that one any consideration. Let's test that against Scripture and see what happens. Um, I mean, Martin Luther said, I've got God in the Bible. I win. I don't care how many millions of Catholics you throw at me. I've got God in the Bible. Right? And what do we have? Deuteronomy 4.35, Deuteronomy 4.39, Deuteronomy 6.4, Isaiah 45.6. We've got 2 Kings 19.19. 19. We've got Ephesians 4.6. We've got 1 Timothy 2.5, 1 Corinthians 8.6, Ephesians 4.6. We've got Mark 12.28-34. Oh, we don't have any. We're, we're going to lose. We don't have enough. We've got the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15.28, as I already mentioned before. I mean... 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. 
1 Timothy 6, 16 says that God is uh, immortal, invisible. You're going to tell me Jesus is God? He doesn't seem invisible. He doesn't seem immortal. He died for our sins, right? We, if we have the scripture, we can, we're going to be okay. Second question. If people find out I'm a Unitarian, they'll exclude me discredit me and say mean things about me, right? All right, let me tell you a little story. Let me tell you a little story. I heard this story not too long ago of a, Christ, a guy who just became a Christian. He goes to work, and he tells his boss, he said, look, I just received Christ as my Lord. I'm really excited about my faith. I just wanted to let you know. And the boss says, oh, that's great. I'm a Christian too. And, uh, and, and his employee says to him, no, you're not. You're not a Christian. And the boss says, what are you talking about? I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian my whole life. You know, I don't, no, you're not a Christian, he says. You're not a Christian. I've been working for you for 10 years. You have never named the name of Christ. You have never mentioned God. You, I've never seen you read a Bible. You've never brought your faith into the workplace in any way whatsoever. In fact, I resisted becoming a Christian for years because of you. I saw that you had, your, you had inner peace. You had a good family life. You had a good work ethic. And you weren't a Christian. So I figured I didn't need Christianity because look at you. Exhibit A. That is the problem when you stay in the closet. Right there. That's a good example of the problem of you staying in the closet about your faith when you're around other people. Just be who you are. Be authentic. Be true to the truth that you believe. And stand up and be counted. And look, if you get persecuted, which is so rare in our world today. I know there are some countries where this is really life and death. And I'm not bringing that into this so much. I'm talking about uh, <clears throat> in most of our situations, but even if it is life and death, and you get beaten up because of your one God faith, then you give me a call or you give your pastor a call and, and, and you say to them, I was just excluded today for my one God faith. I was just rejected. I was, I was fired from a job. I was beaten up. I was tortured today for my faith. And if that pastor's any good, if he knows his Bible at all, he will say to you, rejoice. For so they treated the prophets who were before you. Jesus said this was going to happen to his followers. We're not better than Jesus. If Jesus said it's going to happen to his followers, we might even ask ourselves the question, well, why isn't it happening to me? Well, maybe it's because you're in the closet and you need to get out of the closet. Nobody else is in the closet. We're the last ones in there, Unitarian Christians. We're over here hiding, thinking, oh, well, if anybody finds out about my faith, then, you know, I won't get a job. Or I'll, I'll... Look, this whole thing is not going to change if we're all going to be a bunch of timid mice hiding in the corners of the world. We need to stand up, make some noise. You hear what I'm saying? All right, now what if you want to dig deeper? I've got some books over here I want to show you real quick. All right, the first one I have there is Christ Before Creeds by Jeff Dibble. I, I, I could recommend 14. I just picked four, okay? This is Christ Before Creeds by Jeff Dibble. It's a good book about just what, what the faith is, the one God faith in the Bible. This is a biblical book. It's looking at what the Bible says. Then you have What is the Trinity by Dale Tuggy. This is a philosophical book. Dale Tuggy is the author of the Trinity article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. He is a philosopher. So he's going to have a philosophical approach. And this book will very helpfully show you what the Trinity is, how are different ways to think about it, and as you get a little later into the book, how basically the Trinity just doesn't work. And uh, so it's a very good book if you're interested in that. Then number three here is The Church of the First... Three Centuries by Alvin Lampson. I've quoted it a number of times in this class. And this just goes for, through the first three centuries of Christian history. It's got a lot of quotes in it. It's a very old book. It's, uh, this is actually a reprint, but it's from the year, I think, 1880. 
published in Boston in 1880. But uh, the English is okay. It's, it's not so hard you can't understand it today. And then uh, if you are interested in the fourth century, this just is the book you need. It's difficult. I'm going to warn you. It's written at a college level. But it's so good. And it's written by a Trinitarian, which makes it even better. Um, because this book will give you the inside scoop on all the different chaos and fighting and different positions that different Christians held from 318 to 381. So take a look at those books. And if I tell you what, if you get any of those books, uh, you'll be able to find other books through those books, and you can do even more research depending on how much you want to do. All right, so I want to, I want to end by asking the question, how can you support the cause? What can you do to help the cause? The one God cause today. Well, I have some ideas. First up, social media. If you see somebody posting something about one God on social media, like it, share it. If you see a video, you see an article, like it, share it, these kinds of things. Uh, register with the UCA at UnitarianChristianAlliance.org. Put yourself on the map. It's free. You don't have to pay anything. But if you want to become a supporting member, that's even better because it does take money to do certain things, and uh, that will help us get more done. And then when you see somebody promoting a One God book, just buy it. I don't, I, even if you agree with it already, buy it, buy it anyhow, just to support the cause. And then give it to that relative. Give it to that coworker. Give it to that random neighbor that you think might be interested and see if the book does some good. Books are like seeds. Not all seeds turn into trees, right? But some do. Actually, all the trees in the world alive today, this is deep, came from seeds. All right, share this class with others. Start a blog, a podcast, a YouTube channel. Get a PhD. If you're young and you're watching this and you're thinking, man, I'd really like to contribute to this academically and try to uh, do more research on the subject, go get a PhD, and that would be a big help. Uh, let's say you, you've got lots of friends and you know some celebrities and some influencers. Send them books. Send them YouTube videos. Send them materials and see if you can't convince them. And then last, but certainly not least, pray. Pray for hearts to be open to the true God and the genuine Jesus. Pray that... Uh, and ask God for guidance on what you should do. Pray for those of us on the front lines. You know, you get beaten down, especially on the internet. The internet's brutal, right? You can get beaten down so fast, you know, we really need to support each other, even if maybe we disagree on other things. But in the end, I believe this truth is going to win. In fact, I'm certain of it. I know for sure that this truth, one God overall, is going to win. How can you say that? Well, it may not happen in my lifetime, but God has a dream. God has a dream. It says in Zechariah 14, 9, And Yahweh will become king over all the earth. On that day, Yahweh will be one, and his name, one. God says... He's going to be king over the whole earth, that his name is going to be one. He says that that's the truth that is going to become clear ultimately, that everyone in his world, in the end, is going to believe that he is the one God over all. And so the question for me is not, oh, well, can this, can this idea win the day? We don't have a powerful Roman emperor on our side that's just going to persecute all our enemies. Look, first of all, we're not going to fight dirty, right? Right? Because how you fight matters just as much as what you're fighting for. But second of all, the question is not, are we going to win? The question is, how can you be faithful in this time? God is going to win this thing. In his time, maybe it'll be in our lifetime, maybe it won't be in our lifetime. But the question is, how can you in the 21st century be faithful to this truth? So let's get out there and make a difference for our one God who's overall, okay? God bless. <laughs>